morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My name is Melinda Moulton and I am your host. Today, I am interviewing Greg Guma. Hey, Greg, thanks for being with me today. Well, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad. Today, we're going to talk about your new book, Restless Spirits and Popular Movements. But before then, let me tell our viewers a little bit about you. Greg Guma is a longtime Vermont journalist. Starting as a Bennington Banner reporter in 1968, he was the editor of the Vanguard Press from 1978 to 1982 and published a syndicated column in the 1980s and 1990s. From the mid 1990s to 2004, Greg edited Toward Freedom, then a print magazine covering global affairs and organized one of the first independent media conferences held in Burlington in 2000. In 2004, he co-founded Vermont Guardian with Shea Totten. Two years later, he became CEO of Pacifica Radio. He writes about media and society on his blog, Maverick Media. And Greg has just published a new book, Restless Spirits and Popular Movements, A Vermont History, which we will be talking about today. Greg, what a, what a career. What a lifetime of work. It's, it's a long time, uh, more than 50 years in Vermont. But look what you've contributed to our community and to our world. By the way, your, your new book uh, is beautifully written. For anyone out there who is interested in Vermont history, uh, this is the go-to book. Um, the way that you write is fascinating and interesting. All of the chapters are, are, are stories within themselves. And the way that you weave the words to tell the story is beautiful. Um, I, I was really enamored and moved by this book. So let's talk a little bit about you. Um, Greg, tell us a little bit about your life growing up. Where you well, I, uh, sure. Well, I grew up in, in New York, in the city. Uh, my parents uh, were um, Italian, um, second generation Americans. Uh, my father was a lawyer, became a judge. My mother uh, was a part of the fashion industry uh, through my grandfather, who was a manufacturer. But I wanted to take a different path. And so after going to Syracuse University in the mid-60s, I moved up to Vermont in 1968. Um, and as you say, I, one of my first jobs was as a newspaper reporter, which allowed me to really get to know Vermont you know, at the ground level, first at the local level in Bennington and eventually meeting people around the state. And in a way, that's my postgraduate education was being a newspaper reporter and then working for Bennington College and various things in Bennington, and then moved up here to the Champlain Valley about 50 years ago. So you were here, you were here during the turbulent 60s, right? Oh, late 60s. I, yeah, I, I got here in the yeah. Would you consider yourself part? I, mean, I would assume you would consider yourself part of the 60s movement. Sure, sure. I mean, way. I describe myself in, in my other book, The People's Republic, which was written uh, about 30 something years ago. Um, I describe myself as a hippie. Uh, I saw myself as a member of the counterculture, the, the countercultural wave that that arrived in uh, Vermont in the 60s and into the 70s. And, um, uh, but the difference I suppose uh, between myself and some of the other people was that I often had uh, what you might describe as an establishment job, newspaper reporter, college administrator. I worked for the government and contracts. And so I was in two worlds a lot of that time, particularly in my young, younger life, um, straddling the world of the establishment by day, and my own pursuits as a counterculturalist, a hippie by night. <laughs> so who in your life uh, had the greatest influence on you and your work? Uh, and my work, well, you know, writers, of course, I admire um, uh, really excellent writing. Gore Vidal was an influence, Hunter Thompson as a journalist, Tom Wolfe. Um, I was a part of the new journalism movement, you, you might say, um, and I, uh, and as a historian, uh, Gore Vidal is, he's a novelist, but he's also a historian and political scientist, and there were others like that, and so they were my models, and then there were also individuals I met as I grew up and who were mentors to me. Dave Dellinger was a mentor to me, one of the Chicago Eight who lived up here in Vermont, Murray Bookchin, uh, who was an anarchist theoretician, uh, Frank Wilkinson, who was a civil libertarian. These men uh, taught me 
uh, a lot about life and um, how to function and to combine my uh, interests uh, with my commitments. So interesting. So let's move into your fabulous new book, Restless Spirits and Popular Movements. It is the detailed and deeply interesting history of Vermont. What inspired you to make this book, to write this book? Well, I started on this book, I think more than 40 years ago, really during the bicentennial period, uh, 1976 in Vermont, when there was a lot of hoopla about America, America at that time, a uh, very patriotic period. Um, and myself and my friends, I was working, I ran a bookstore at that time in Burlington, the Frayed Page. Some people may remember it. I remember it. Yes. Yeah, one of the first used bookstores in Burlington, myself and a, a collective, and we published a magazine out of the bookstore called Public Occurrence. And out of the magazine came a history of Vermont called Vermont's Untold History, a kind of Howard Zinn-like look at Vermont from the standpoint of labor movement and the women's movement. And that really began the process of writing this book. I've been adding to the stories, collecting stories, collecting analysis since that time, really. And about 10 years ago, I started to sort of organize it as, a, as one uh, manuscript, uh, almost published it about five or six years ago, um, and then just decided to wait until I found the right partners and, and the right time. So it's a long process. But you live through all of this, a lot of well, it. Well, not all, I, I, but all No, all of the recent stuff. I mean, you, a lot of, in, the, in this book, you, it was very personal to you. That's true. Although, I mean, I'm hoping that this book is, I could say, is my least personal book because I'm trying to write history. And although I do uh, go into the first person, uh, about two thirds of the way through, because I think it's important that you can contextualize who's telling you the stories they're telling you. So I felt I needed to introduce myself and my role to some extent. Um, uh, and so, yes, I did interview a lot of these people. Howard, I know Howard Dean and Phil Hoff was a good friend and Bernie and I have known each other for almost 50 years. And so a lot of the interviews and the episodes that I describe are things that in many cases I observed directly, you know, the, the, particularly in Burlington. Well, it's a, absolutely. And you can see this throughout your book. Um, I believe that this book should be, should, that every high school student should have to read your book. And I believe that they should bring civics back into the, into the, into the education of our students. And this, is, this would be a great civics book for, your, for the students. Well, I, I'll be honest with you, that is what I have in mind. I, I, I wrote it, I hope, in a, in a way that can be read by people at the high school level and at the college level. Um, it's academically sound, but it's popularly written. And it's, uh, that's, that's my intention is, is hopefully to make it a kind of an evergreen, at least for the next you know, 10 or 20 years until someone updates it again. So how do we get this into the hands of the students? Because um, you, you write in a way that's a very, it's, it's an easy read. Um, yeah. It moves from chapter to chapter, almost like short stories. It's beautifully done, Greg. And I think that every, every high school student should be required to read this book. How, so how do you make that happen? Well, I think first uh, their parents, in a way, have to read it. I'm hoping to get it into a lot of bookstores in Vermont, um, have book reviews and people like yourself. And I think I, it, I, the book industry has changed a lot since I got involved you know, 35 to 40 years ago. Um, and in some ways, because of the Internet, it's easier to get your book published but it's in a way harder to get your book distributed in the way that we used to be able to do. So I, I think it's going to be a process of education, reviews, um, but I'm hopeful. I mean, I'm going to go around and try to speak in, in classes if I'm invited. And, uh, you know, and, and we'll see, maybe a few years from now, teachers will begin to use it. So all my viewers out there, we're talking to Greg Guma, who's just finished writing the book, Restless Spirits and Popular Movements. Um, and I want you to talk to all of your children's teachers and tell them that your children should be required to read Greg's book. Um, so I want to move on to the Sedition Act because I've been using that word a lot lately. I don't know if you have, but I've been using the word a lot. And I want and you to talk, and and I want you to talk a little bit about the Sedition Act. And, and why is it not being implement, implemented today with all of the sedition that we have seen in the past several years? 
leading up to January 6th. Talk to me about the Sedition Act. Explain this to our viewers what it is. Sure. Well, I mean, the answer to the second question of why, you know, why nothing's being done now is a problem of the breakdown of the political system, a very complicated question. But if you go back, the Sedition Act, as I've described the uh, the initiation of it uh, in the late um, 1800s, uh, the 1890s, 1898 in particular, um, we had our second president, John Adams, and John Adams was um, uh, embattled. Um, the country was splitting into factions already, the Jeffersonians and the, and the Adams people, the Federalists, and, um, uh, you know, and uh, the, the, I would call them the Decentralists, um, which eventually became the Republican and Democratic parties. But at that time, Adams was very concerned about, uh, on a practical level, people accusing him of being soft on France, which was the, uh, making moves uh, in the in the South, in Florida, and so forth, and so uh, he um, and his wife, with his wife and the approval of a lot of people like Washington, uh, passed had passed by Congress the Alien and Sedition Act, and the Sedition Act made it uh, made it a crime to uh, say anything negative about the government or about the president in particular. I think Donald Trump probably thinks about this and like would like to see that version of the sedition, would have liked to have seen that version of the Sedition Act still in force. And, but instead of it being um, used uh, against foreign enemies or threats, it was used against American citizens. Um, Benjamin Franklin's grandfather, son, uh, and then eventually a very prominent Vermonter, Matthew Lyon, who I describe in the book in a chapter uh, that covers this, was put in jail for writing a letter to the editor uh, that criticized President Adams. This is a very dangerous uh, kind of law. Um, these have existed um, uh, at different times. One, one could describe it as a law against thought crimes, um, uh, uh, although it's not always the, um, the charge brought in a case, there's always an undercurrent of uh, an accusation of un-Americanism or threats to America. And it's been mobilized against a variety of groups in, in Red Scares at, uh, at different times after World War I um, as well. Um, the Sedition Act and also the Espionage Act. These two laws uh, have been used very indiscriminately over time. The ironic part is now that the people who used to be defenders of the Constitution are now the seditionists. Um, it's almost as if history has been flipped on its, um, on its head now, um, where you have an insurrectionist political party. It, indeed, and we'll get into that in a, in a few minutes. Um, thank you for that. I would love it if you could read from your book. Um, and I chose the section about James Jeffords. Um, and it's, you're going to start at page 152 and finish up at the bottom of 153 uh, and talk about Jim Jeffords, who was another renegade re Republican who left the party and became an independent. And I will never, and I'm sure you were there that day at the Radisson Hotel, uh, the day yes, that so Jeffords stepped. I mean, that was like a moment in history for me that will live on in my heart forever. So I, I chose that because I wanted you to read um, this from your book. Would you be kind enough to do that? I'd be glad to, and I'm glad you picked it in a way because uh, you know people might think because I am a, perceived as a as a progressive journalist that I have nothing good to say about Republicans, and so this may correct the record a little bit. Well, you also say good things about George Aiken, and I don't know have you ever seen yes. my husband's film about George Aiken? I don't know that I have. No. All right, I, I will send I will send you his video. He, Please. He's a beautiful Please. film on George Aiken, which is beautiful. I will get that in the mail to you, my friend. All right, so go ahead and start reading. I, I, I'm just gonna sit here and listen to you. Okay. James Jeffords was another renegade Republican, an independent thinker in the Aiken Gibson mold. His career began conventionally, but after a stint as attorney general, his path to the top of state government was blocked by Dean Davis, the national life insurance executive who succeeded Phil Hoff as governor in 1968. Davis preferred Luther Hackett, a fellow insurance man, and Jeffords was defeated in the 1972 Republican primary. He regrouped and replaced Richard Mallory in Congress in 1974. From that point, on, point onward, Jeffords built his congressional career on defying easy classification and frequently bucking his own party's agenda. 
In the early 1980s, he opposed President Ronald Reagan's tax cuts, and in 1993, supported the Clinton health care plan. In 1994, despite his defiance of GOP orthodoxy, he succeeded mainline Republican Robert Stafford into the U.S. Senate and continued along a maverick path. One example was his sponsorship of an anti-discrimination bill to prohibit the use of a job application sexual orientation as a basis for hiring, firing, promotion, or compensation. Another was his support of the UN, neither pleased many of his Republican colleagues. On October 1997, Jeffers was honored by the UN Association for backing a volunteer system that would give soldiers the right to choose UN peacekeeping. A month later, he received the Freedom of Choice Award from the Vermont chapter of the National Abortion Rights Action League. Typically, the award went to a grassroots activist. But despite his position, senator and lifelong Republican, his name sprang to everyone's lips because of work he had done throughout the late term abortion ban debate. Standing up for women's rights to choose was a risky thing to do, and once again, made him unpopular with right-wing groups. But Jeffords was used to being a target from the left and the right. During a debate on FDA modernization, for example, he was accused of reducing the laboring requirements for irradiated foods by Food and Water, a Vermont-based environmental group. In offering the legislation charged the group's director, Michael Colby, Jeffords had shown that he was, quote, more concerned with the well-being of big business than with the health and safety of his own constituents. Nevertheless, he remained one of the state's most popular figures, a liberal maverick who called himself a Lincoln Republican, and near the end of his career, frequently reminded his conservative colleagues that he was the radical right of the Vermont congressional delegation. Confounding ideologues at both ends of the political spectrum, he capped his career with defiance of the Bush administration over tax cuts and his subsequent exit from the Republican Party in 2001. Jeffers ended his career as an independent. Wow. Beautiful. It's a, it's a, it's, I, I wouldn't call these things a sort of definitive uh, biographies. They really are just sketches, uh, anecdotal sketches, because there are so many characters I'm trying to bring into the story. So, um, uh, and uh, that was also based on journalism that I had done over the years, covering the events that, uh, that you mentioned, for example, his, his, uh, his resignation from the, from the party. And, um, and so, you know, I feel that uh, in this sense, I'm trying to be nonpartisan perhaps, and, um, and, to, and to appreciate the contributions of people across the political and ideological spectrum. You are nonpartisan. Because I believe there are sort of core values in Vermont that overarch all of that. Well, you are nonpartisan. This is not a this is not a political book. It's not really. And That's well, okay. it, well, it's you're not you're nonpartisan. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's restless spirits and popular movements, um, and they're they're snapshots. That's right. And you move from one period to the next in these fat in the way that you weave it all together. It's beautifully done, Greg. So it's hard to believe in Vermont, it, that Vermont had a eugenics program, but many of us are coming to terms with this. And you write about this in your book. Can you talk a little bit about that, Greg? Yeah, well, this was in the 20s and it's a double-edged thing. And, um, you know, and this was going on around the country. I'm not saying that Vermont was the only place, but it affected uh, Franco-Americans, it affected Native Americans. It was a, a sterilization program that was initiated on very uh, false assumptions uh, and also as a kind of a hygiene, part of a hygiene movement. It started really in the early 20s, was legislated in the late 20s in Vermont, and uh, a number, uh, quite a few people, hundreds of people, Native Americans and others, were uh, sterilized, uh, supposedly with consent, but really it was a false consent. They were really not aware of what was being done to it. It was also um, a part of uh, other movements in Vermont earlier than that. I mentioned I mentioned it also in the context of the uh, perfectionist movement in the early uh, 19th century that um, uh, John Humphrey Noyes was involved with the Oneida community. Um, that was sort of a, a, 
perhaps you might say more altruistic version of it, planned births, planned um, uh, breeding program. But, um, but obviously by the 20s and the 30s, this had been embraced by fascists and, and Nazis. And, uh, you know, and it's something that Vermont hid for a long time. Um, I think it really was only in the 1980s that we really began hearing it once the, the, the law was actually repeal, officially repealed. Um, that you began to tell the story. And, and to some extent, that's what I'm trying to do is unearth some of these stories, like the story of the eugenics movement, the Green Mountain Parkway, the fight against McCarthy by uh, Ralph Flanders, um, and of course, the James Burke's mayoral uh, career in, in Burlington, which I believe was uh, underreported on at the time and also to some extent repressed by historians uh, subsequent to that. And I think the same could be could be said for the eugenics movement until the 1980s. And I think there's a real reckoning right now about the eugenics movement too. Um, so uh, it's definitely a dark, dark, dark time in our history. Um, being, being a railroad aficionado and waiting for Amtrak to return to the back of Union Station this spring uh, after 30 years of looking for rail to return to Burlington. Can you talk a little bit about Central Vermont Railroad? As you write, it is the most significant railroad story. Can you share a little bit with us about that story? Well, you know, it, this this is this is probably going to be a little more difficult for me because it's a it's sort of I haven't memorized the entire book. There were obviously a lot of railroad men who ended up being governors of Vermont, and the railroad system in Vermont developed in a rather piecemeal piecemeal uh, manner. There were a lot of conflicting lines and uh, and jurisdictional issues, and so um, although railroads came to Vermont, it it produced it actually produced a kind of an economic depression when the lines stopped stopped being built mm -hmm. through central Vermont, and a lot of, and there was a a depression in the 1870s as a result of both um, overexpansion and uh, and corruption to some extent too. The railroads were uh, to some extent uh, subject to the early phases of um, of uh, big business corruption, the credit mobilier scandal across the United States, where a lot of uh, congressmen were lining their pockets. In Vermont, the industry was much more upright, but there were a lot of bankruptcies and there were a lot of um, uh, railroad men who also managed to parlay their position in the railroads into political careers. And so you have, I think, at least three Republican governors who were also the head of different railroads. Uh, later, it became a jurisdictional issue between uh, Benning, uh, Burlington and the Central Vermont Railroad in the time of um, James Burke, when the railroad controlled waterfront land in Burlington and Burlington uh, was looking for a place to build a wharf. And at that point, um, the mayor of Burlington and uh, uh, Percival Clement, who was the head of the Central Vermont Railroad, formed an alliance. Although they were still arguing about what the control of waterfront land, they were also in a political alliance. And so uh, the railroads, I think, along with the marble industry, are probably the two industries, certainly in the 19th century, that had the most profound impact on the state's development. And uh, certainly the people who ran those industries um, also ran the Republican Party. And also the boating industry. Uh, but but let's let's know, too, in your history that uh, that the city of Burlington under uh, Bernie Sanders, I believe it was maybe Peter Clavel when he was mayor, uh, did beat the railroad to take back the property that is now Waterfront Park. That's true. And that's not a story that I tell in detail in this book, although I do tell it in detail in my previous book, The People's Republic. Right. And I just want to make a note of the fact that uh, initially the Sanders administration was going to go the easy route, um, but it was defeated at the ballot box in a bond vote and had to return to the public trust doctrine which you're describing as the way in which we were able to gain control right. yep. of some of the waterfront land. But that was a, a proposal that was brought to it in a, in a way, if not forced on the administration, the administration was persuaded by necessity of, of pursuing that strategy as a result of actually some democratic um, uh, activists and lawyers. Howard Dean was involved in that. Uh, Rick Sharp was involved in that. John Franco. Course, John Franco, John of course. Franco was a student, big John Franco yeah. 
pursued it legally. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that um, had it not been for the opposition to the original waterfront plan of the Sanders administration, that might never have happened. And so in a way, it's another example of people speaking truth to power, in this case, in Burlington in 1983, 1984, and 1985, it was environmental activists, dissident Democrats, and naturalists generally who said, yes, you were right, Bernie, the waterfront is not for sale. Well, I was involved in all that because that was the Alden waterfront. Right, so you know, you know. And, exactly I, re and I remember that so well, and we lost by, um, it, we needed 60, 63% or something. And, and you got about high 50. We got 56%. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Paul Brun was working with us and everything. But then when it all, you know, when it all dissolved because we didn't get the bond, the bond vote didn't pass. We didn't get That's the right. majority. Then everything was re, you know, reconfigured. And we went back and, and, and became- And we came up with something and we became Well, became Main Street Landing. And uh, right. we supported the public trust doctrine because that land for us was only under option. And we were really excited about the park, but we we redesigned the entire company then to do slow incremental design and development. So that there, was are at least, there, there are at least two examples in Burlington's recent history where the first plan was rejected and then this, the what followed was an improvement which really reflected a fuller understanding of public sentiments. The marketplace is, another, is, the, is the other example of that. The original marketplace plan, much more intensive, you know, and much more intrusive. And because that was not accepted, we had to sort of rework it and come up with something that really satisfied public needs much more broadly. No doubt about it. It all was so much better. Two, two women with a vision. So it, yeah, it all, it all was so much better. Um, so the public trust doctrine, anyway, um, that's so interesting. I want you to talk, let's see how much more time we have. We have about, we don't have a whole lot more time. So I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm gonna focus on this, Greg. Um, you, this, I'm talking to Greg Guma, who is the author of Rush the Spirits and Popular Movements. Uh, it's a Vermont history. And I recommend everyone go out and get Greg's book and read it and, and have your children read it and give it to their teachers and tell them to make their students read it. If you want to understand Vermont history, uh, Greg did a terrific job. How do you take this history, Greg, and you apply it to what's going on today? Because today, I don't know how your mind is feeling about today, but mine every day feels like it's going to explode uh, with the uh, challenges to our constitution. And um, you go back in time, uh, you know, a couple hundred years to, to, ca to categorize the history here in Vermont. H how do you see the future for our world and for our state in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Well, you know, I think uh, Vermont, like a lot of other parts of the country, has some choices to make. The American system is over 200 years, almost 250 years old, mm -hmm. a very old constitution. Uh, the constitution is in need of revision. It's not functioning as it should. And I think Vermont, the role that Vermont has played over the past 15 to 20 years is to some extent, uh, I described it to some friends as the anti-Texas. It's portraying a set of values, which in a way are a mirror uh, opposite of what is being put forward by Texas. So I, I think to some extent, we have to continue to present and, um, and promote our brand. And that our brand includes our vision of what society can be like. And what, and what I'm trying to do in the book is to portray the values that underpin Vermont that have evolved and emerged over the years. And I think the choice for Vermont, to be very frank with you, is a choice between continuing to pursue as Bernie Sanders and Howard and others have this idea of reforming the American system, if we can do it, which I'm not positive we can do, or I think that you were going to see a gradual devolution. All empires, when America is an empire, uh, ultimately end or devolve over time. And I think to some extent, we're either going to come together and find a renewed united purpose around a set of values that we agree upon, or we're going to see a, a sort of fracturing into um, more autonomy movements. You're going to see, that's why I discuss issues like secession and nullification, which of course I know to liberals right now are really not popular ideas because what's being put forward now is that we have to put our faith in the federal government to somehow make it right. Mm 
that may occur, but not without major structural change. And I'm not positive that the Constitution will permit that. And so Vermont should pursue its own values. It should work for self-sufficiency and, and, and present its vision of, of, a, of a good society as we do through Bernie Sanders and Patrick Leahy and others, um, but hold open the prospect that we may have to become more independent. And we may also have to, to some extent, at some point, nullify certain federal laws. If the US bans abortion through the Supreme Court, I know that, um, that Vermont is not going to acquiesce. Well, I mean, I, I wanna, well let me mention that to you right now, our reproductive liberty amendment. Prop five is moving through through our legislature, and it's going to become to a, it's going to come to a public vote, um, and that's that's the reproductive liberty amendment, which we are going to put into our constitution, to um, to confirm the right uh, to reproductive liberty. A great example, and I think we need to project those values. I, I, I wish the media wasn't so oriented toward toward conflict. Uh, there's there's a, a kind of a a saying, which I'm sure you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm. Um, uh, that's in journalism. If it's if it's a, if it's a, if it's violent, if it's if it's conflict. And I saw this even when I was a reporter in the 1960s. If an accident happened at 10 p.m., they rip out the front page and put the accident on the front page, even if we had another story. That was 50 years ago. Things haven't really changed. But Vermont has the possibility of presenting its values to the country through its representation, even through its, look at the Republican governor of this state who, is defy, who has defied Donald Trump and is making, is, has made Vermont one of the examples of how to handle the pandemic. So I think we are a potential model for the type of values and the type of approach to community building and grassroots democracy that might hold out some hope for the future. But I think we also need to become more self-sufficient. I agree with you. And I think we're doing that in food and in all sorts of areas in Vermont, you know, energy, we, we are trying to become more independent. So we have a couple of seconds here. So what's next? What's what's next on your agenda, Greg? Well, uh, actually, I'm working with um, Nora Jacobson, the filmmaker right now on an adaptation of a novel I wrote about 15 years ago called Spirits of Desire. And it's a, also a Vermont story about a family of mediums in Chittenden, Vermont, and all the amazing people who came to visit them in the 1870s. And we hope to turn it into a movie. We'll see. Um, uh, and it's a true story, a true Vermont story. Um, and so I'm working on that. And I'm also hoping to do in what, what might be the third volume of this so far two volume set, The People's Republic and Restless Spirits, which would be um, a more of a memoir and uh, travel um, uh, writing, uh, Maverick Tales and Travels, which would revisit uh, my personal experiences uh, over the years here and elsewhere. Well, you were such a gift. You are a gift to all of us, Greg Guma. And I wanna thank you so much for being on my show. And, I, and again, Greg Guma, the author of Restless Spirits and Popular Movements of Vermont History. I encourage everyone to go down to your local bookstore and pick up a copy and read it. So Greg, I'm gonna sign off now. I'm gonna ask you to stay on, uh, but thank you to my viewers and I will see you shortly. And thank you for, uh, for listening and watching my show, Moments with Melinda. <laughs>